Good afternoon. I'm Maxime Schreier, and uh, some of you know this, but others are probably new to this uh, group. I direct uh, the project on Russian and Eurasian Jewry at the Davis Center, and uh, we launched it last uh, fall with the support of Genesis Philanthropy Group, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, we have uh, an exciting um, series of events. This fall, there is a flyer that's going around. Please take a copy. Please invite friends. We will have three more really fascinating events. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank uh, the Center for Jewish Studies here at Harvard for their support of our endeavors. And I'm really excited to welcome Ellen Friedman and Joshua Rubenstein, who uh, will speak this afternoon. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Ellen Friedman first. Uh, she was born in Kyrgyzstan, and so the story she will tell is not just an academic story, it's also personal testimony. Kyrgyzstan, as in the former Soviet Republic, and now an independent state in Central Asia, and began her primary education in Berlin. Professor of English and Holocaust Studies at the College of New Jersey, Ellen Friedman is the author and editor of many books on American literature and culture, among them books on Joyce Carol Oates, 20th Century Experimental Women Writers, and Contemporary Representations of Morality, as well as numerous articles in scholarly and popular journals. Uh, she inaugurated the Holocaust and Genocide Studies program at her college, and I must say it's a very, very impressive program at the College of New Jersey, and uh, also led an NEH grant on women and the Holocaust for uh, New Jersey teachers. Uh, Professor Friedman is a member of the Faculty Advisory Council of the Fortunoff Video Archive of Holocaust Testimonies at Yale University. And uh, I'm also very happy to welcome my good friend and colleague, uh, Joshua Rubenstein, who many of you know. Uh, for many, many years, uh, Joshua Rubenstein was on the staff of Amnesty International USA as the Northeast Regional Director. And he's a longtime associate of the Davis Center and uh, serves as Associate Director for Major Gifts at the Harvard Law School. Joshua Rubinstein is the author of many books on Russian and Soviet topics, among them Tangled Loyalties, The Life and Times of Ilya Ehrenburg, a very important biography, and Leon Trotsky, A Revolutionary Life. Uh, and his most recent book is The Last Days of Stalin, which has appeared in about 10 languages, I understand. Eight. And eight. Well, uh, <laughs> Look, uh, maybe next month it'll be 10. Uh, the subject of uh, Ellen Friedman's uh, talk and her new book is truly fascinating. It deals with uh, the largely unknown story of the survival of Polish Jews in the Soviet hinterlands during World War II. And uh, the story is at the center of her new book. This is a topic that is both somber and not so somber, and in the spirit of not making it too somber, I'd like to share a little anecdote before I invite Ellen to the podium. So imagine this is the spring of 1989. I had only been in this country for about two years uh, as uh, a former refusenik refugee from Soviet Union. I I'm about to graduate from Brown and I'm uh, waiting to hear from graduate schools. I have an interview at Yale to meet uh, my future professors, which is where I went to graduate school. I'm in Alexander Schenker's office. He's uh, an esteemed linguist uh, and Slavicist. Uh, he looks at me and there's this little sparkle in his eye and he says, you know, I'm a closet Stalinist. At the time, I hadn't fully understood this type of American humor or this type of Jewish American humor, so I was really floored. And then he opened uh, his closet door, and there it was, Stalin's portrait hanging on the inner side of the door. And he explained that uh, he, he owes his survival to Stalin because he was one of those Polish Jews who, as a teenager, uh, escaped to the Soviet hinterlands. So uh, I uh, share this because, uh, of course, this is not only a story of death, but also one of survival. And with that in mind, uh, I'm very, very happy to welcome Ellen Friedman. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
my way here. Um, okay, I'm going to turn this on. Can you hear me? Is it working? Is it working? Yes. It, now it's working. Great. So thank you, Maxine. That was a great uh, introduction and a wonderful story about your encounter with um, your first encounter with academia. OK. Uh, so um, the title of my talk today is The Wrong Family Holocaust Story, Survival of Polish Jews in Stalin's Russia. And I'm grateful to Maxime and also the Davis Center for having me here. Um, so there were seven Polish Jews, and it was 1939. If you can't hear me, just um, indicate in some way. Um, so there were seven Polish Jews from Warsaw, and it was 1939. I heard their stories when I was already married and a mother. I don't know if they told them before then. I only know that's when I began to pay attention. It must have been around the time of the American awakening to the Holocaust in the late 1970s and 1980s, with TV specials and movies suddenly giving status to their European accents. This attention encouraged my father and his two brothers to talk more about what happened to them, even though theirs wasn't a Holocaust story of the first order. The stories captivating Americans were about concentration camps and gas chambers and death. My family's stories come out of a different narrative. Of the 3.3 million Jews in Poland before World War II, only about 350,000 survived the genocidal intentions of the Nazis. The largest number of these Polish Jews survived in the remote prison settlements of the USSR. My family stories are about this experience, about how they outwitted their circumstances and survived. It was the kind of story that did not count as about the Holocaust. It was the wrong Holocaust story. It was the wrong Holocaust story after the war when my family, members of the seven of the title of my book, first encountered concentration camp victims. It was the wrong Holocaust story in the DP, the Displaced Persons Camp in Berlin, when the record keepers and statisticians ignored these Polish survivors. It was the wrong Holocaust story when they went to immigrate to the US. During the Cold War, all things Soviet were suspect, and so they lied about where they had survived. Not just my family, but all of them. It was the wrong Holocaust story once they got to the US, where the numbers on concentration camp survivors' arms told a story higher in the hierarchy of suffering. It seems that it is still the wrong Holocaust story, the story of how Stalin inadvertently saved Polish Jews from Hitler by sentencing them to banishment in special settlements, prison camps, and what the Jews themselves called gulags in the Soviet Union. First, theirs is a story of survival and exile and seems to confuse who counts as a Holocaust survivor. Even most Polish Jews who survived this way describe themselves as refugees rather than as survivors, despite the brutal conditions they experienced. Secondly, the story of Polish Jews in the USSR adjusts not only the geography of the story of Jews during the Holocaust, but also somewhat blurs the boundary between the story of the Holocaust and the more general story of World War II. An additional challenge to the historians interested in this population is the many languages involved. These Polish Jews, for the most part, did not repatriate, so their testimonies and records are in many languages, Russian, Polish, Yiddish, Hebrew, English, and so forth, creating an additional hurdle. But the memories that occupy me in my book are personal and inherited as well as the memories of a community currently, currently underrepresented in the Holocaust narrative, that of Polish Jews who survived in the USSR 
and they contribute, I believe, to Holocaust cultural memory. But also, they, they, they then connect in the cosmopolitan way to the memories of the millions of refugees and exiles going through these experiences right now. My family memoir, The Seven, is an account of such survivors in their own words, as well as the effects they've had on the generations, on the generation, one generation that followed them. In my book, I present the oral testimonies of the people I interviewed beginning in 1985, but I also edited and arranged these testimonies, and I added my own words to theirs, interweaving my own account of their experience. So I'm a puppet of their stories, but also a puppeteer, as I think you'll see. So I'm going to read now from um, excerpts from uh, section two called Joseph uh, from my book. When I was 12, Joseph, the eldest of the three brothers in the story, grabbed my ass. I told my parents and they talked to him and he denied having meant anything. After that, he stayed away from me, didn't talk to me directly until I interviewed him for the book. I was stuck on his chicken farm in South Jersey for many weekends as a kid because my parents' living was selling work clothes at a farmer's market, and that happened on weekends. Well, it started Thursday afternoon and ended on Sunday. Sometimes I went with them, but it was boring. I would sit on that grabbable ass and read but they stayed there from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., and 12 hours at a stretch is a lot of hours to spend reading. In answer to my interview questions, Joseph was honest about a lot, but not everything. He wanted to control the narrative. He portrayed himself as the wise rescuer, the one who saved his brothers from the Nazis and then the Soviets. Despite his slight size, he was a tough, he owned guns and knives. There was a sense of icy self-sufficiency about him. Who would play him if he were casting himself? Someone with grit, a fighter, a man of few words, emotionally cool. Daniel Craig, perhaps, the most raw and least suave of the 007 James Bond movie leads. Although it is filled with improbabilities and danger, in an international setting, Joseph's story has no glamour. Survival seems to be the goal that underlies his life from the beginning of the war to his death. Ironically, of the seven Polish Jews who left Warsaw together, he seemed the least enamored of life. He told his younger son, Pavel, that at 70 he was ready to die. Each additional year was gravy. I asked him, when did you start bike riding? I started bike riding when I was 15. We belonged to a club and we went on all kinds of excursions. How did you get your bicycle? My parents bought that bike. Did they buy that bicycle? Dove, his younger brother, complains bitterly to this day that he never got a bicycle. Laughing, well, I know why, because my father was upset with me with this bicycle because I, didn't, it, because I didn't want to work. I always want to go away with my bicycle. Joseph came from a family of tailors, and like most working class Jews in the Warsaw ghetto, they ran their shop in their apartment. I asked Joseph about living conditions when he was young. The conditions of living, they were so frustrating in comparison if you compared it today. For instance, we worked seven days a week, and not only eight hours a day, but sometimes 15, 16 hours a day. And when it came to collect the money, the debtors couldn't pay us the money. So everything, everything what we made went on the book. Then we went to the, into the grocery store and we bought on the book. Whatever you did need, you have on credit. You know. Every week you pay so much and so much. You couldn't have the opportunity, the chances to save up and pay for it in one time. And the debt on the books came higher and higher and higher. It never came down, always more and more and more. Because the Jewish trade was in the ghetto, 
you living in a ghetto and you have to deal between yourselves and nothing outside comes into the ghetto. Nothing comes in that you can make a better living. Did you go to the movies? Oh yes, I went to the movies. In those days I saw the Lost Horizon movie. It's a movie about the mountains in the Himalayas where some scientists got lost. They hiked there and they found a paradise. Everybody who lives there lives a life forever and never gets old. And the moment they stepped down from there, they got old and they died. Joseph talked a long time about Lost Horizon, this 1937 sci-fi adventure fantasy film by Frank Capra with Ronald Coleman and Jane Wyatt concerns a group of airline passengers stranded in the Himalayas in a utopia called Shangri-La, an Eden without death or deprivation. Although all but one of the passengers who leave it die one way or another, one of them, the film's hero, played by Coleman, returns to it in the end. From one perspective, it was an escapist vision for the times. It was a terrible moment, post-World War I, post-Depression, the Spanish Civil War and European fascism in progress, and the looming war against Hitler. In these circumstances, who wouldn't want to contemplate Shangri-La rather than the world as it was? But utopias such as Shangri-La are also last resting places. As a space for eternal life from which there is no leaving, Shangri-La can be construed as a kind of death, for everlasting life is also death. Heaven is a nation of the dead. The film received seven Academy Award nominations and won two. Joseph was drafted into the Polish army when he was 20, the only one of his friends who was drafted. I said to him, you came out of the army in 1936. How did you think of your future? You didn't expect too much from the future and you didn't expect too much from the present. It was every day with no difference. You knew that you're going to get up in the next morning, you're going to do the same things a week later, a year later, and you didn't see any special perspective in your life which you could distinguish that something is going to happen. Oh, you felt that you're living in a society that nothing, nothing moves. You have to live this way. Nothing is going to happen because the anti-Semitism was very great. You were in the reserves of the army for a while and you said you were called back into the army. Just two months before the Germans invaded, I went back into the army. They proclaimed a general mobilization in July and all the guys on reserve went to barracks outside of Warsaw. We stayed there and then we heard that the Germans already are crossed over the borders and there were fights between the Polish army and the Germans and then the Germans start coming closer and closer and then we started defending our position. It was not far away from Warsaw. Germans came in and they start talking over the country, taking over the country so fast that you just keep running away further and further and further from the Germans to the east of Poland. Did you run by yourself? Did you run with a unit? Well, sometimes I went by myself, sometimes with some others, and sometimes I got mixed up with some that I didn't even know. They came from all directions. It wasn't clear. The Polish army didn't have any defense. Before mine eyes, I didn't even know what happened. A lot of soldiers were killed right when running in the ditches. The shooting came from both sides, so a lot of us got killed. And meanwhile, we were going always more to the east. I was waiting with three platoons of my command with machine guns, and we guarded a bridge. And the Germans came on motorcycles with, with machine guns attached to them, and we start opening up on them. And they were flying in the water because we opened at them from all directions. And we had about three or four times like this. And quite a few Polish soldiers were killed, and a lot of Germans, they were killed but this didn't hold them back. They send in more and more, and then they start coming with the planes. And when they start coming with the planes, we didn't have any rescue for it. Machine guns, no machine guns, we couldn't hold them. They start gaining on us, and we ran into the countryside, into what, what do you call it, with the hay and the stock inside? We ran in there. 
In one case, they dropped the bomb on one side, and they killed all the Poles who were on that side, and I was on the other side. And I got a little wounded in my knee from shrapnel, and I managed to get some horses in a wagon, some military horses, and after going a mile or two, I found a hospital. There were so many wounded that mine things didn't even count for a lot. I had to fix with it myself to take care of it. And this was in a little town near the border from Russia. Now when I walked out from this hospital, I didn't have nothing to eat. I had no place to sleep. It was Rosh Hashanah, so the Jewish people went there in the synagogue. And I was standing there before the synagogue in my uniform, and some people came out, and they looked at me, and some, some came closer. They asked me some questions, and I said, I go into the shul because I was wounded. I talk Jewish. Oh boy, as soon as I start talking in Jewish, the people took me into their homes, and they gave me something to eat, and took care there with some bandages and everything. I went to Warsaw, I would say, in the month of November, and then already everything was very strict, tight. The borders, they were patrolled, and I was holded on the border. Anyway, I went to Warsaw, and it was nightmare going to Warsaw, because the cattle wagons had a lot of poles, and what they didn't like They had a lot of Poles, what they didn't like. The Russians, and they escaped to the Germans. Uh, they had a lot of Poles, what they didn't like. The Russians, and they escaped to the Germans. Commas are sometimes useful. <laughs> and they were talking on the Jews, all kinds of things, that the Russians are sparing the Jews. The Jews can get away with what they want. And if they could find out that I am a Jew, I was in Polish uniform anyway, so they couldn't recognize me, and I was with two other guys. And on every station, the SS came up looking in your face. They shout, Juden raus. This was the first time that I felt very offended, and I felt persecuted. It was very frightening. Anyway, I went to Warsaw. So I went to mine house. The moment I came in, you cannot imagine the joy for my mother and father, and I had a sister there, Sonia, and I had a little brother, Mutl, there still. Okay, now, I remember, I said to my father, I said, up till now we did believe that France and the English and the other nations are going to sit down with them, and they're going to give Hitler a few things to shut his mouth, and everything will be all right. But this is not the way it goes. So I told him what I read in Mein Kampf, what Hitler support what he wants to do to, with the world. He wants to make a pure Aryan race, and they're going to be built of blonde and young people. I said, they don't want people like you. So my father told me, I'm older than you. I went through the first war. I worked for the Germans, and they were very good to me. I sewed for them. They gave me food. They gave me money. So I told him, this is not the same Germany. They are not the same. Why do you want to stick here? So he said to me, no. He built up there his business. He had machines. He has new mahogany furniture. You know, like the old people, they sitting on their five cents and they wouldn't move on them. So I came to Warsaw and it took three nights. I slept there in our house. In those three nights, I went through scares all the time. We lived in a big complex where you have to come to the big door and push the buttons to let you in. And every night, two or three times a night, came in the German SS and they look around to take out people. And this got me on my nerves. Son of a gun, I got through the war and everything and I made it this far. I am not going with them now. Joseph and Joseph's girlfriend Henya and his best friend Chapka Two of his brothers, Dove and Yitzhak, and his sister, Sonia, and Yitzhak's girlfriend, who would become my mother. That adds up to the seven from which this book gets its title. They went to Brest, just across the Boog River, to what was now part of the USSR, to their uncle's house. Then the Soviets, Stalin, 
banished them to Komi SSR in a special settlement called Nifchim. That's how Stalin saved my family from Hitler. Their sister, Sonia, though, had a boyfriend in Brest, and she went back to him from Komi in 1941 and was there, having married him when the Germans violated their pact with Stalin on June 22nd. My aunt Sonia and her fiancé, whose last name was Finkelstein, were there when the German Einsatzgruppen A entered Brest. They witnessed the German shooting at Jews randomly. Then in December, along with other Jews, they were forced into a ghetto. They were ordered to replace their yellow stars of David with two yellow circles, one on the chest and one on their backs over the left shoulder. This practice was modeled on a practice in medieval France. Around November 10th, they registered for identity papers with their photographs on them. I saw Sonia's papers with her photograph. She recorded her last name as Finkelstein, so she may have married her lover. If they lasted until summer 1942, they were transported 117 kilometers to Brunaya Gora. Seven trains with about 200 people per car brought them there. A short distance away, large pits were waiting to receive their bodies. In March 1944, the Germans tried to hide their crimes by having locals dig up the bodies and burn them. When the Germans invaded the USSR, Stalin liberated the Poles he had banished to remote areas and gulags in the Soviet Union. Except for Sonia, my family went south to the Asian republics in cattle cars. On the way, Joseph was separated from my father. Once in Asia, in Osh, Joseph was drafted to the Russian labor front. His voice again. So I had to go. I had to go to Kyrgyzia. I was in Kyrgyzia past Frunze to the Chinese-Soviet border. Over there, they spoke about building a railroad to China. This was high in those mountains. OK, now I'm coming. Now listen to this. But this you have to listen careful. I'm coming to Frunze. I'm coming to the town of Frunze. And over there, I wasn't guarded, just on my own. I have to go there where they want me to go. I came to the town of Frunze. I was hungry. I was dirty. And I had malaria with me, which I had my malaria all the time as long as I was in Asia. I came over there, and I had on my feet. I didn't have any shoes good. So my feet were wrapped up with all kinds of things. And this was monsoon season. It was coming towards winter, you know? And I was walking, and I walked on this bazaar in Frunze. You know what a bazaar is? I was walking at this marketplace in Frunze. Well, I'm walking in Frunze on this bazaar, and I didn't even look up. I'm looking down, not to step too deep in mud. And I'm looking and looking and looking. And there, before me, about 10, 15 feet before me, all of a sudden, I saw a woman with a fur coat. And this coat, I said, where did I see this coat? My goodness. And then it came to me. I said, this is Lola's coat. Lola had a coat like this. But I didn't know what to say. I didn't realize that this is going to happen. Maybe some other people had a coat. How am I going to meet her here after so many years, and it's so far away? It had been almost three years since the brothers had seen one another. And I start walking faster, and I'm making a search around to see the front of her. And she looks at me, and she had some kielbasa and some bread. And the first thing what she did, she put in all the kielbasa in my mouth. Not a word she said. And then the bread. And then we start talking. And boy, oh boy, I said, I recognize the coat. And I told her the whole story. And we went from there with a little train to the place where they were living. And they were living in Kant. Didn't I tell you before, Kant? This little place, Kant. And she comes home, and, and Yitzhak, he came in and said, I don't believe it. I don't believe my eyes. And then we told him the whole story. And I took off all my clothes and we burn it. It was with lice and dirty and everything. 
and I got some new clothes, and I stayed there with them a day or two, and then I said, I have to go to the place where they told me to go. I came to the place. It was a very high mountain, and you went in. It was like a prison with electric wires and things like this, and five in the morning, you have to walk maybe a quarter of a mile for soup, and it was so slippery, so bad, so cold, so slippery, that on the way back, it spilled. We didn't have much to eat unless you took it there and you gulp it down. Then we went with one what is in charge and we start going up the mountainside. We went up the mountainside and on the first day, right away before my eyes, it came a sudden wind and it was ropes there, all the time ropes to hold you on because the wind and the ice and the things was so bad that the slightest slip and you're going down, down forever. We were already on the China side, on the other side, and in front of mine eyes it came a wind and three people, like you see, picking them off like in a tornado. So, so it took off the three people and they disappeared. This was the first day. On the second day I went there and I saw the same story. We couldn't move. It was too dangerous. On the third day I went again and it was the same story. And then at least when you come home, you wanted to sleep, but you can't sleep. The ice eats you alive, the, the lice eat you alive. Joseph's service for the Soviet labor front was in the Tian Shen Mountains of Central Asia, a chain that straddles Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and northwest China. Its tallest peak is almost 25,000 feet high. Nothing he knew could compare to it. He was a working class city boy who had sat sewing pants in the bosom of his family except for brief rebellious bicycle excursions with his buddies. No reference existed for him to this malevolent exotic world. Into Thin Air by John Krakauer describing the 1996 climb to Mount Everest that killed six people expressed his feeling of finally standing on the summit of the mountain he had just ascended. I just couldn't summon the energy to care, Kra uh, said Krakauer. Krakauer. Krakauer was a journalist, and he had chosen this assignment. Thrill seekers, the other men who made the climb, had paid $65,000 each for the expedition, just to die or, pee, or be too depleted to give a shit. Joseph did not begin with a sense of adventure. He was fighting for his life. On that third day, I got two friends, and we decided we were going to escape from there. We had with us the tools, what we worked there with them, so that you took each of us pliers and cut through the wires, make big holes, and we escaped 40 kilometers by foot, crawling along the highway. Over there, the highway, they had deep ditches on the side, like for water to drain. We crawled there in the ditches on all fours that the police or anybody who goes there was not to see us. And this way, we went 25 miles to the station, to the first railroad station. This was 1944, and the war ended in 1945. And I was working in Osh as a tailor. And then they start coming runer, rumors that they're going to free us, go home to Poland back. And this was so unbelievable, like somebody would tell me, you're going to live 200 years. After the war, the brothers went to Stettin in Poland, bypassing Warsaw, where everyone they knew was dead. Eventually, Joseph followed my father to Germany. His wife, Henya, had had psychotic breakdowns, imagining the SS everywhere. She didn't take care of their two babies, so he put them in an orphanage, and he put her in an institution. Danny, Joseph's older son, his memories include his biological mother. They are not pretty. He thinks he was four or five when on one of their uh, I'm going to start that sentence again. He thinks he was four or five when on one of her visits from the hospital, he was sleeping in the same bed as his mother when he wet it. His mother took him by his feet 
and hung them out of the second story window, yelling. This would be in Yiddish, I think. Don't do that again. Don't do that. That's his only childhood memory of his biological mother. I go to a nail salon every couple of weeks. Usually the manicurists do not talk beyond a cursory, how are you? But this Korean woman asked a lot more questions. She wanted to know what I did for a living, all about me. So I also asked her about herself. She told me that she had married young in Korea and had a baby boy. Her husband came to the US and worked in a nail shop owned by his brother-in-law. Then abruptly she asked, where does all the love go? Where does it go? Where is all the love? The question flummoxed me. She talked about love as if it were material. It's there and then it's not. Where did it go? Her husband fell in love with a white manicurist in his brother-in-law's shop. He no longer loved the mother of his son and she hated him for that betrayal. Once she came to the U.S., she lived in his house and worked in his shop. But where was the love now? Where did it go? I sometimes think about that as I think about the couples in the story. Where did the love go? Some went to madness. Some went to starvation and other deprivations. Some did not go away but shifted its shape. And some went into the pits at Brunaya Gora, the fetid air of the Warsaw Ghetto, and the smoke of Treblinka. I asked my cousin Danny if he remembered immigrating to the US. Danny's memories are specific about the early years in the USA. He spoke no English and was beat up on his way home from school. He remembers the misery of being an immigrant, being different in a way that seemed to offend people enough to want to hurt him. Between 1948 and 1952, Almost 3,000 Holocaust survivors, many of them from Poland, bought chicken farms in South Jersey, including my Uncle Joseph. Vineland, deep in the Pine Barrens, was one of the main destinations and came to be known as the egg basket of, of America. It attracted Jewish immigrants for a couple of reasons. First, there had already been a couple of waves of Jewish immigrant farmers here before. Second, that's how immigration to a certain place happens, by accident and precedent. You have a plan to go to the US. How do you decide where to go? Close your eyes and put your finger randomly on a spot on the map of the US? I have a friend who went to a tiny college in the south straight from Nigeria. How did you even find that tiny college, I asked. It seems that all of the boys from his neighborhood who came to study in the U.S. went there. Why? One of them had gone some years ago, and the others followed, forming a satellite of their village. A neighboring town to Vineland was another such place. In the summers, we would go to Alliance Beach in Norman, New Jersey, with other immigrant families. My parents spent their days playing cards, gin rummy. It was a beach carved out of the woods along the banks of the Maurice River. There was a barn-like structure there with a jukebox and snacks for sale. I loved that place. When I was 14, 15, 16, I would shake my grabbable ass to rock and roll, which kept spinning out of that jukebox at three songs for a quarter. Sweet Little Sixteen by Chuck Berry and Peggy Sue by Buddy Holly. If I got lucky, some bare-chested hunk would ask me to slow dance to Who's Sorry Now by Connie Francis or You Send Me by Sam Cooke. Alliance was a tiny rural Jewish community that had upwardly mobilized from its immigrant and ideological beginnings. Touch a spot and it bleeds history. The first Jewish settlers were refugees from late 19th century Russian pogroms funded by Hyas they formed the Alliance Agricultural Colony in Norma in 1882. Each of them got 15 or 40 acres, depending on the source I consulted, to clear in order to farm the land. The ideology was back to the soil self-sufficiency. Of course, most of these people were not farmers, so there was no back to, only forward and up for the lucky ones. The second and third generation Jews who lived there in the 50s and 60s 
were lawyers and doctors and business leaders. Their children, my generation, left Alliance never to return. Their parents are, are buried in Alliance Cemetery. Joseph is buried there. I asked Joseph why he invested in a farm. Because you talk with friends and what they came here before you and they said they're doing a nice living. They don't touch nothing in the farm. They have a bum or two and they and, and they doing all the dirty work and they ride around with the cars to Ocean City and Atlantic City and they enjoy and this is the way they did. They didn't exaggerate but I went in with the wrong foot. I got sick chickens and everything was going sour. The chickens, they got cholera. I had to go and borrow money from Uncle Sam, the Farmers Home Administration, the FHA. I lost all the money in the first three months when I came here in 1952. I lost the chickens. I lost the feed what I feed them. I lost the medication what I gave them. And besides, let's say when I came here with $25,000, I invested at least 15000 in chickens. So the rest assets, what I had was the farm. That's all. But the farm wasn't worth nothing. When things start going bad and the prices start going down, nobody wants even to buy farmland. You couldn't give it away for nothing. His, done, his son, Joseph's son, Danny, remembers the sudden poverty he remembers going to school with holes in the soles of his shoes and keeping his feet flat on the ground so no one would see them. He laughed as he told the story. Danny has that salesman's habit of treating misfortune lightly. Joseph declared bankruptcy in 1968. Before declaring, he gave Danny 30000 in cash to hide from the government. He bought a small house with that money and he spent the rest of his life doing tailoring in the garage of that house. I asked Joseph on our last interview, what was your happiest time when you think back? Well, you know, before the war started, that was the best time because I was young. I didn't have any responsibilities. I went with my friends always with the bicycles. Where were some of the places you went to on bicycles? For instance, we went, let's say, from Warsaw to Zakopane in the Carpathian Mountains. It's more than 300 miles from Warsaw. We also went to Gdansk and Vilna. We went to Brest-Litovsk, and then we made a trip around the border of Poland. This was a trip about 2,000 miles. I always took off, took off from home. On that bicycle, he was young and on his own and ready to claim the road. In his memory, the bicycle took him away from the grind of work, from the grim poverty of his family life, from the oppression of an alcoholic, spendthrift father, from the seductions of a loving mother who wanted him close. It took him out of his own history to a paradise of carefree freedom. Joseph's role in the story of the seven is a story of his personal victories over brutal, assaulting circumstances. How? except for in the U.S., time, and again, he outwitted fate, and finally, how he was chained again, more than he had been in Poland, to the sewing machine, doing tailoring for pennies, and this time, stranded without a bicycle. Despite all the miles he covered and the exotic, punishing lands to which the war brought him, he had traveled no distance at all. In the film, Lost Horizon, before they decide to return to civilization, the Coleman character tells the Jane Wyatt character that even though he's been, quote, kidnapped and brought here to Shangri-La against his will, he is, not ang he is not angry, that everything feels somehow familiar. The Jane Wyatt character explains, you've always been a part of Shangri-La without knowing it. She continues in that optimistic way that the movies of the 1930s had, that there's a wish for Shangri-La in everyone's heart. All people are hoping to find a garden spot where there's peace and security, where there's beauty and comfort, where they wouldn't have to be mean and greedy. She wishes that the whole world would come there. The Coleman character replies in an offhand way that the audience could take as a joke. If that were true, it wouldn't be a garden spot for long. That's it.
it. <laughs> Ellen, thank you. Um, I'd like to make a, a comment or two and, and um, point out a couple of things. Um, of course, this is the story in the, in the immediate sense of uh, a group of Polish Jews who represent a gro a, the broader group of Polish Jews who were fortunate enough through the displacements of the war to find themselves on the Soviet border, on the side of the Soviets, the Soviet side of the border, um, after June 1941. And because of the peculiarities of how they as Polish citizens were treated by the Kremlin, they were removed from areas near the border, eastward, east of the Urals, out of reach of the Germans. So in that sense, they were evacuated, not simply exiled. And that evacuation is what led to their rescue. So I want to point out that Sonia's side of this story, who's among those killed because she returns to Brest, she returns to areas that will, in fact, be occupied by the Germans. Right. Now, when the Germans invaded in June of 1941, they were invading a Soviet Union that was larger than it had been two years earlier in 1939. During those intervening two years, the size of the Jewish population of the Soviet Union had increased by maybe a couple of million. So the total population of, of Jews in the Soviet Union, we'll call them Soviet Jews, is now 5.5 million. That includes Jews from Eastern Poland, that's now Western Ukraine, right. from Bessarabia, from uh, these other sections that Stalin had been able to uh, fold into what was then Soviet territory. Now of those 5.5, Soviet Jews, as we'll define them, it ends up that four million were in territories that were ultimately occupied by the Germans. So all of those four million were, in a sense, immediately in danger. Right. And of those four million, about 2.5 million, we believe, now were killed, which makes up a, a terribly, terribly uh, big proportion of all the victims of, of the Holocaust. So the story of this small group of Polish Jews and their adventures, and there are many, many adventures in this book, uh, especially for the six who survive, also reflects the underlying story of Soviet Jews who did manage to flee eastward or were able to hide or were hid by neighbors, Jew, by non-Jewish neighbors. Evacuated or were part of the army, because there were upwards of a half million Soviet Jews in the Red Army who fought valiantly, and many of them, of course, died. So I just want to point out that this is a broader story than just the story of Polish Jews who were this very fortunate minority. Um, secondly, um, I want to point out, and people, I think, get a sense through Joseph's story, the, the, the size of the displacement they, they, uh, they, they experienced. Near the end of the book, you have this very startling paragraph, which I'll read to everyone. So this group of Jews accumulated so many miles of exile, totaling more than half the circumference of the earth, approximately 127 miles from Warsaw to Brest, 216 from Brest to Minsk, 443 from Minsk to Moscow, 169 from Moscow to Yaroslavl, 440 from Yaroslavl to Kotlas, 205 from Kotlas to Sitvikar, 31 from Sitvikar to Nuvchim, 2,385 from Nuvchim to Osh, 384 from Osh to Frunze, 200 very steep miles to the Tanshin Mountains, 1,568 from Aravan to Chelyabinsk, 1,113 from Chelyabinsk to Moscow, 3,128 from Frunze to Stettin, back in Poland, 94 from Stettin to Berlin, obviously after the war, 3,972 from Berlin to New York City, 
639 from New York City to Cincinnati, and 613 from Cincinnati to Vinland back in New Jersey. So you can just imagine all this schlepping around to be one step ahead of something, either chasing them or escaping them or looking for refuge or just a better place to be, to hunker down while all this is taking place. But what made them, in a sense, fortunate is that once Stalin, quote unquote, freed them, recognizing they were Polish citizens after the German invasion, they could travel. They were given a laissez-passer within the Soviet borders and to leave, which set them apart not only from the Polish Jews who were trapped and engulfed, but from their fellow Soviet Jews who did not have this travel permission either within the borders of the Soviet Union, let alone to leave the country. Right. So that the amount of good luck compounded by the resilience they, they exhibited and the, uh, their status is what led to their survival. And I think the story um, is certainly a very remarkable one. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with you. Oh, thank you. I, thank you very much. Good. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know um, how to respond to that. I mean, I agree with everything that you said. There's, uh, uh, theirs is a, they're just one population and um, in the larger scheme of things, quite privileged. And I think they felt that too. They felt, um, uh, especially, especially once they encountered um, uh, camp survivors, how privileged they were. And that was in Ber- in Poland, but also that, Berlin. That was in uh, that was in Poland, and then in Berlin, yes. Um, finally, I want to point out an unusual chapter, which I urge everyone to read, Chapter Four, uh, which is a dialogue that Ellen recorded between her parents, obviously in New Jersey. Uh, yes. Um, and yeah, maybe New York. And New I think Jersey, it it. Yeah. it it's not only heartrending because there's the tales about what happened to the family and the losses and the grieving, but the interchange between the parents is kind of a combination of Abbott and Costello <laughs> and George Burns and Gracie Allen, for those of you who remember um, those American comedians. Um, and so it gives a human side to these people who are not simply heroic for their survival and beneficiaries of good fortune and resilience, but they don't lose their personalities. Their idiosyncrasies, which we all have. And um, it's also a tribute to their survival, that they're not um, just burdened by their experience, but enlivened by it as well. Yeah, that, um, that's true. I mean, Dove, one of the, uh, uh, one of the characters in this book, talked about um, Comey in the um, tundra, uh, frozen tundra of um, the Soviet Union as if it were summer camp. I mean, it was uh, uh, just amazing to me. And um, uh, then he took a breath and he talked about how um, uh, how, how, you know, how he was frozen and how um, uh, he always had the hardest work and he had to chop down trees. Um, this was, you know, um, and yet he remembered it with some uh, fondness. I, th- I, I, th- I, I didn't talk about this aspect um, of things in the book, but I think part of their resilience uh, and um, uh, and why uh, their, the way they told their stories was so different from other accounts I've read is that they were working class. I mean, they were used to um, sometimes going hungry, um, uh, working very, very hard, not having a lot. And I think a lot of the accounts um, that are given were given by uh, Jews in um, more intellectual classes and higher classes, not working class, really. Well, this is your book as well. Yes. <laughs> and I'm not working class right, yet. Right, yes. right, right. <laughs> Joshua, can you finish? 
I'm fine, sure. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say two things before we open the floor for questions. One, a very important announcement that Ellen's book is uh, available for purchase and signing. So those of you who are interested will be welcome to um, buy a copy, and I highly recommend it. And I also want to make a, co a comment, which in a way stems from what Josh just said, uh, which is that in this story, many of the survivors are working class. Uh, and of course, it's a very complex story, and it's a story of survival, but I also think it's a story of silence and of darkness. And I want to share one piece of it that uh, I'm quite familiar with, uh, which is, of course, not in Ellen's book because it deals with those Polish Jews who stayed in the Soviet Union uh, yeah. rather than returned and emigrated. And as you can well imagine, many of them were members of the intelligentsia, particularly the artistic and uh, intelligentsia and academics. And I'll just uh, offer one example. It's uh, the late Soviet musicologist Yuz Korn, who is now particularly well known as a founder of a method, the so-called method Kona, the Korn method of structural analysis of music. Uh, and uh, he ended up uh, in Tashkent. He married uh, his former graduate student who was not Jewish. They stayed. Uh, I got to know his family through my parents in the 1970s and 80s. And uh, he was a professor of music at a satellite conservatory in Petrozavodsk, which is a satellite conservatory of the St. Petersburg Conservatory. So it's in uh, Karelia, in the sort of northwest. And the point I want to make is you could talk about anything with this person. He was multilingual. He was incredible. But you could never talk about the Shoah and survival. This was absolutely a taboo sub subject, so much so that he would just get unwell when you asked him, um, because a big part of his family had died uh, back in Poland. And so the silence dealt with, had to do with survival and those circumstances through which they ended up in the Soviet Union. So I'm particularly grateful, Ellen, for the fact that you brought this up in your story. Yeah. So um, let me just add another well-known figure in Soviet music was also originally from Poland, Mieczysław Weinberg, okay. who became very close to Shostakovich and married into Mikhail's family and suffered because of that. He married Mikhail's uh, oldest daughter, um, and they were in Tashkent together during the war before returning to Moscow. So this Polish Jewish uh, remnant that survived involved many different stories, um, and sure. not just people who returned to Poland or went to Palestine and Israel, but who stayed and made their own contributions to Soviet society and culture. Absolutely. Perfect. And we have some time for questions, which is great. There is a mic that is traveling around. Just please raise your hands and uh, ask questions. Over here in the front. Hi, I'm George Dayak, and I, I really enjoyed your uh, your reading and your, you. your uh, presentation. It was beautifully told and uh, beautifully recorded. Um, the, the way you recorded your uncle's uh, story. I, uh, I, could you uh, speak more into oh, the mic? Oh, okay. Sorry. Great. <laughs> um, so I, I was a little bit surprised by one thing, though. Maybe you can fill in the details of sure. how did how did. Um, uh, Joseph managed to save up twenty-five thousand dollars. I mean, that, at that time, that was a lot of money for an immigrant. I know my parents also came over as immigrants in in fifty-seven, and they had maybe twelve dollars. <laughs> so um, he probably got that money after a while of, of you know having worked here. A so. black black market. Um, uh -huh. this, uh, the uh, the way they survived was um, uh, by grifting. You know, black market, and and after the war, he stayed in uh, Joseph, in particular, stayed in uh, uh, Poland longer than all the others because he was making money, um, despite the fact that his uh, wife had psychotic uh, breakdowns, despite the fact that he had no one to take care of his kids, he was making money, and he stayed, um, and he was doing it all through 
you know, um, some kind of grifting black market here. And that's how they got through the war. Uh, they were uh, absolutely in, in the underground economy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he didn't do so well. He only came with twelve dollars, though. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, Very welcome. Which is really important stuff. Thank you. And survivors, and to know as many stories as we can possibly hear. But you know, I'm more interested in hearing from you and about what it was like for you to grow up in this kind of family and, and what, <laughs> what conflicts did you have? I mean, you don't have to tell personal, personal things, but anything you'd be willing to share would be very interesting because I don't have any Holocaust family. We're all, I'm third generation and I feel yeah, very was, blessed. Um, Can you, uh, third generation. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was really hard. Um, you always knew you were an immigrant. I mean, you were, uh, in, even in this Vineland, um, uh, in South Jersey, uh, the, there were the American Jews, and then there were the immigrants, and they were extremely uh, distinct. They, uh, they didn't mix at all, and um, I was desperate to Americanize, so I, I didn't want to be with the immigrants. So through school, I made friends with the Americans. I mean, I, I didn't have an accent. Um, and so I, I, I could sort of pass until I got, uh, until I met the parents. And, um, you know, when I met the parents, I suddenly became that little immigrant girl, right? A kind of uh, charity case. So uh, I think my cousins and I always had that sense of being outside of um, uh, that safe place <laughs> that the American Jews occupied and my mother forget about it I mean she was just alone <laughs> she just felt all alone except for me and uh, the rest of them just uh, adjusted in different in different ways I mean um, uh, each of my cousins so yeah <laughs> But at that point, it, it becomes you enter the immigrant mainstream. I mean, that the feeling of being outside and, and struggling and vulnerable and wanting to join. I mean, that's that isn't a Polish Jewish no story. Not at all. I mean, that's no, it's a story an immigrant of, story. Well, that's why I I um, I connect this story with uh, all the story of of immigrants and and, and refugees and exiles today, million, all the millions of them, um, I feel very connected uh, to their plight. This presentation leads me to ask a question, though it's not directly related, and Josh, you might be able to help on this. Um, I would imagine you could go to Poland now and read this book aloud because it talks about the Poles in Russia. But, and has the law school thought about anything that might occur with the new Polish legislation about the history of Oh my of God, Poles? yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, a, you know, it's exasperating. Actually, there, uh, there, there's a Polish scholar that's putting together a collection on this population, and I'll have an excerpt in it. And she's translating um, a little piece of my book into Polish. Um, uh, they're going to have a conference in Warsaw next fall, and I'll be there. Um, uh, I, I don't know what to say about that craziness. I. I uh, um, I uh, am shocked that the ground doesn't just spurt up blood to, to remind, uh, uh, to remind um, that very conservative government of their past. I mean, it's, um, it's un unthinkable. Well, let me say, I'm not in the faculty at the law school, so I'm not in a position to, to say... 
Well, I think it's too early for that. Um, there are examples in Lithuania where they actually tried to prosecute some part of Jewish partisans for uh, their attacks on Lithuanian nationalists during the war. But that was eventually dropped. Um, and now we see these kinds of threats of censorship. Um, but it's it, it, the, the history is told in so many streams that contradict each other in Eastern Europe and the Baltics in particular. Um, so the Poles are right if someone says Polish death camps because these were German death camps within the borders of Poland. But should that preclude talking about the indiv collaboration by individual Poles? And according to the law, no, that's okay to say. One can't accuse the Polish nation. But there was no Polish nation. There was no Polish government. The Germans took over the east and then the central portion. For a time, the Soviets did on the eastern portion. And then it's all German uh, actions, officially. But then what do you do about Polish underground units who represent something a bit broader, who focused on Jews and killed Jews, who sought refuge? So uh, they're creating a hornet's nest, I think, and maybe eventually they'll regret it. But Eastern Europe is going through this terrible uh, traumatic, traumatic revisiting of history. You go to Budapest and there's a museum of terror and it's very much a right-wing version of what the Hungarians experienced. And there's one little corner in that museum about the Holocaust. There's a separate museum on the Holocaust. Um, so they don't know how to handle this history, and they don't know how to handle, and frankly, we don't know how to handle the fact that there are individual Jews who are active in the communist movement who helped to impose Soviet rule. That's simply a fact. Rakoshi was Jewish. Beirut was Jewish, one country after another. Slansky was Jewish, paid with his life for that. Was, what, Beirut? was not? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So but the fact is there were these figures. Um, are they part of Jewish history? Do we regard them as, as betraying Jewish history? So the, the, the currents of history here are so hard to untangle. But they're not doing a good job of it, and they're not doing it in good faith, that's all. Well, I, I mean, I think that's the essential point, that it's not good faith um, <laughs> that's going on now, yeah. <laughs> Rather than the uh, sort of details of the law, it's um, uh, uh, the attention to the government that, it, that it's drawing is, uh, is one of bad faith. Just to bring this back to the Soviet Union and to Russia, I'm curious, perhaps you could talk to us a little bit about uh, the research and whether you traveled to some of these locations, particularly in the Russian North and in Central Asia, and whether there's any memorialization going on there. I'm at all, not at all familiar with that particular question, because of course there were large populations of Polish Jews living there, particularly in Central Asia. Right. Um, so what is, the question is... First of all, whether you traveled I to did. these places and what you could tell us a little bit about that. And also whether these places bear any tangible memories of uh, those communities who were there in transit or temporarily. So um, I did go to the general geographical locations, so not to the specific not to a lot of the specific places. I went to Breslatov, where um, my great uncle gave harbor to these Warsaw Jews, to his brother's family, and uh, to everybody that my grandfather uh, sent to my uh, great uncle's house. Um, I did get there. Uh, the house was gone, but there were other houses like it, and uh, that was quite moving. Um, when I got there, um, the most uh, it, it, there were no traces of these people, and uh, uh, at the time, some of the news was occupied with uh, Jews trying to reclaim their former properties. Remember, there was there was sort of a big um, like in in the late 1980s. Uh, or mid '80s, there was a, a, a there were a lot of news stories 
about uh, people trying to reclaim their former properties. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so when I started to ask about Jews in Breslov, and particularly about a particular property, I, I, was, I was just um, shut off. Nobody wanted to talk to me because they were afraid I was there to take, take back some property. Um, uh, that was my guess. Um, and all the street names had been changed, and, um, uh, but I did find where the street was. Uh, the other places, I got close, but I didn't get there. I did not get to Kant. I did not get to Frunze. I did not get to Comey. I got to um, Irkutz. I had to um, travel with a group at that time. This is before the uh, uh, before Glasnost. Um, I had to travel with an in-tourist guide uh, through the whole trip. I had to travel with a group, and uh, certain places were just forbidden. And Comey was one of them. Nuftchim in Comey, um, Kant and Frunze. I couldn't go there, but I got to. Um, I went to Tashkent. So I got a general sense of the geography. Um, but uh, most of the descriptions in my book aren't, aren't from my seeing, um, my seeing the places. And uh, as far as I could see, from the point of view of a tourist, uh, I saw no remnants, although I'm sure, I'm sure there's lots of them. Uh, I don't speak Russian. I, you know, came there just as a tourist, and uh, so. Let me just say, and this yeah. is tangentially related to what you just had to say, there's a wonderful new film, very somber, called 1945, about uh, a group of Jews returning to a little village, this is in Hungary, uh, who are survivors, and the town is engulfed with fear that they're going to lay claim to property they had been forced to abandon. And uh, that's not what happens. I'll just leave it at that. But it's a very startling movie, very understated, but very dramatic. It came out last year, I think. It reached us. I'm trying to think of the uh, title of the film, and it's not coming. Ida. Um, yes, that's yeah, about the, the woman who's of Jewish origin who becomes a nun. And who becomes a nun, but, uh, uh, but she uh, goes back to her family's place. And the Poles who are there are afraid she's coming. Um, for her property. There's also a movie which actually was shown in Boston as part of the Boston Jewish Film Festival a few years ago, and I actually reviewed it, uh, and then it played at the Berlin Jewish Film Festival. What's, it's called A Gift to Stalin. Uh, and what's interesting is that the screenplay was written by David Markish. David Markish, who is... Uh, one of the two sons, the living son, because his older brother, Shimon Markish, passed away, of uh, Peretz Markish, the great Yiddish uh, Soviet author. And David Markish lives in Israel, but uh, in, as a child he was exiled to Central Asia following the execution of his father. And he lived there with his mother, and he encountered some of uh, the Polish Jews who actually were still there. And so the story weaves together a narrative of a Jewish Soviet boy and some Jewish Polish refugees and also also uh, uh, the, the local Kazakh population. Uh, and it's quite remarkable, actually. I'll have to see it. I haven't yeah. seen it. Is that based on a written memoir? It's based in part on David Markish's own experience, some of the fiction he wrote, uh, and I, I mention it in the anthology of Jewish Russian literature in the, in the piece about him, but also there's a fictional story that sort of uh, expands on the personal experience, uh, but it actually is uh, quite, quite relevant to Ellen's uh, story. So uh, we have time for, I guess, one more question if there... Uh, Please, let's wait for the mic, yeah. I get a second chance. <laughs> um, 
another thing that you you mentioned based on some other questions before um, that struck a well that brought up a question for me was you, I think you mentioned your your cousin Danny's um, experience and I, I think this must have been in the 40s or early 50s where he was picked on by kids in America in, in the 50s right and I, I find that different from my experience I mean I was also an immigrant I came here when I was nine years old and I f and grew up in Queens Boston or Queens New York Queens New York and I, I found, you know, American kids very friendly. And, uh, of course, it was a, a largely, well, partly Jewish community, uh, but maybe half Jewish or something like that. Sunnyside, New York. But uh, I, w was it different in the 40s or early 50s, uh, you know? Well, it was, uh, I, I think we're talking um, 1953, 54, 55. Um, uh, I think it was uh, it, it, it was rural, it was farmland, um, it was largely Italian, uh, and um, it wasn't a Jewish neighborhood. You know, it wasn't Queens. Queens uh, is used to having very uh, a very heterogeneous population. There are lots of different immigrants that went to Queens. Queens has this wonderful uh, immigrant history, right? Um, so it was a different just a different population. And, um, and there was lots of anti-Semitism in Vineland, and particularly for, uh, against immigrant kids. I didn't experience it so much, um, and not in the way that my cousin did, because he was, I, I lived in town, he lived in, on a farm. Thank you so much again, Ellen and Joshua, and thank you all for being here. And again, there are copies of Ellen's book available here for purchase and signing. Thank you. <laughs>